What's up everybody? Today I'm going to be covering my recent winter trip to Alaska. Epic mountain ranges, amazing landscapes. They don't call it the great land for nothing. There's plenty of photography opportunities, opportunities for drone flying. I got some epic FPV footage out there. A lot of photographic opportunities as you would expect. Not so much wildlife, that's kind of a summer thing, but uh, I'm going to be covering all the logistics, how to get there, how to get around. Driving can be a little bit tricky in the winter with all the snow, where to stay, cheap options for eating, and of course the location advice as it pertains to photography, hikes and stuff, what time to get there, what time is the, when is the best light to shoot them, how to get there, and uh, everything that you need to plan your possibly upcoming trip to Alaska. So let's dive right in. So the main reason people travel to Alaska in the winter is for the auroras the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis, whatever you call it, the amazing green lights in the sky. They are very common. It's one of the few places in the United States. Sometimes you can see them a little bit further south, but Alaska is very well known for the Northern Lights. They are primarily seen in Fairbanks. So when you're flying into Alaska, your two main uh, largest cities to fly into are Anchorage or Fairbanks. If you are doing a trip where you're gonna be primarily just shooting the auroras and you're really not interested in seeing some of the national parks and stuff like that, which uh, I don't know why you would you skip out on, but uh, you might wanna just fly into Fairbanks if you're gonna be spending most of your time there. Now, as mentioned, this guide is gonna be focusing on my recent experience and I went in the winter. So what do you think of when you think of uh, Alaska in the winter? It is gonna be very cold and do all your proper research as far as uh, what is the appropriate attire for uh, below freezing and below zero temperatures. It involves a lot of layers, uh, neck warmer, hat, uh, beanie, your gloves, any exposed skin, especially when you go up to Fairbanks and anywhere further north if you, if you are more adventurous. But anywhere where it's gonna be below freezing and you have exposed skin, within a few seconds, within a minute or two, it's gonna start to burn, it's gonna get really cold, can make uh, photography very uncomfortable, Touching your camera can be difficult, so invest in some high quality gloves for sure. I use some gloves that I uh, bought from an Iceland trip, and when I went to Norway, I found out that they were not really as good as I really needed. So when I was planning my Alaska trip, I definitely uh, invested in a $200 gloves. They have a removable mitten part, so you can actually cover them up when you're not using your fingers or take it off when you need the uh, dexterity and you're dealing with the camera controls and changing lenses and all that. So definitely do your research for uh, your proper attire. A couple good things about visiting Alaska in the winter is there's really not gonna be a lot of people around. It's more of a summer destination just because people don't really wanna brave the elements of the winter. So uh, as I was making my way around and exploring these locations, I really only saw some photographers out when I was shooting the auroras. Most of my time I was spent uh, pretty much shooting the locations on my own. So that's a good thing. Secondary thing, about uh, visiting in the winter is the prices for everything is gonna be a lot lower because it's the low season low demand equals lower prices so anything lodging uh, car rentals and all those kind of things um, gas price probably fluctuates according to other standards but a lot of things are gonna be a lot lower in price because it's the low season and it's uh, not a lot of people traveling there and I mentioned before about the wildlife in the winter there's really not a lot of wildlife around if that is what you are going for then it's probably better to go in the summer when I was there I saw a bunch of moose around, but they don't really have their antlers uh, until spring and summertime. Not to be insulting to the moose, but they're not very interesting to shoot without the antlers. They just look like some big, large cow kind of animal. And um, saw some of those around, saw a golden eagle, and I might have seen a bald eagle while I was uh, driving. But really, there wasn't a lot of animals around, so if you're going for wildlife, definitely choose the summer instead. So when it comes to driving in Alaska in the winter, it really depends on your experience level because uh, I live in Miami and I have driven in Iceland and Norway and driven in some snowy locations, but I was not fully experienced in driving when it's uh, recently having been heavy snowed the day before or when the snow is kind of slushy and uh, or it's kind of frozen like ice on the road. Anytime you start or stop, you're kind of slipping around. You don't want to take any sharp turns. So do your research and drive very carefully, especially if you're not used to driving in snowy conditions because it can be very dangerous and more dangerous in the sense of hitting other vehicles. I was more nervous driving around the city, uh, Anchorage and Fairbanks, around other vehicles, stopping and starting because I wasn't really accustomed how the car was uh, responding. And they don't actually put snow tires 
on the vehicles for some reason. They use all weather tires, so it doesn't have the little studs. And then as far as what vehicle to choose when driving in Alaska in the winter, definitely go for a four by four vehicle because uh, if you're gonna be exploring, you're gonna be out on your own, you don't wanna be, get caught on a snow bank, you don't wanna run into anything that is uh, too high for the car, a regular car to get over. If you were just to stay around the city, um, which is not very adventurous, but if you were to do that, maybe it would be okay to rent a regu regular vehicle. But uh, if you're gonna be driving up to Fairbanks from Anchorage or vice versa, or driving around to some of the national parks, a four x four vehicle is uh, highly recommended. Additionally, when you're driving around, like I said, there are amazing views and vistas and you just wanna pull over everywhere and just take a photo. And that's actually what I did. And, and there are a lot of pullouts where there's a sign, you'll see the pullout and it's very clearly marked and it's plowed out. But avoid the temptation to just pull over wherever you want, no matter how good the uh, photo opportunity looks because as I found out when I was in Denali, I uh, pulled over to what I thought was the shoulder of the road, but it was actually a plowed snowbank, which basically was a two foot drop in my vehicle pretty slowly and calmly, but drove off the road. And luckily the park ranger was driving around and within a few minutes they were able to pull me out. But um, they did tell me that the price to get towed if there was some damage to the vehicle, luckily there wasn't. If there was damage to the vehicle, the price to get towed can be in the thousands and it can be a very expensive uh, hiccup in your trip. So really take care when you're pulling over and just look for the signs, you'll see them everywhere. There's pullouts on Glen Highway, on the main highway uh, between Fairbanks and, and Anchorage. And there's plenty of places where you can uh, pull out safely and uh, get off the road to take your photo. Also, you should do some research on techniques and methods for getting out of the snow if you do get stuck. Because uh, when I was over in an area called, uh, I'm not really sure what it was officially called, but it was sort of the Delta Junction, Paxton area. I pulled over to a plowed pullout, but uh, it had been plowed possibly a couple days earlier and some snow had built up and the 4x4, uh, it was a Toyota 4Runner, actually got stuck and uh, I wasn't able to reverse and I had seen some techniques where you take the uh, floor mats from the car and use them as traction. That didn't really work. I've heard of using uh, cat litter as traction and actually one of the uh, snowplow drivers eventually drove by and he uh, actually didn't even have to pull the vehicle out. He got into my vehicle and he sort of used this method where he drove back and forth until he cleared a small area to a point where he could get some momentum and do a uh, hard reverse and back out of the snowbank, which wasn't really a snowbank. It was just, as I mentioned, some snowed over pullout area. So, and that was kind of in the middle of nowhere. So you don't really, you really don't want to get stuck um, you don't really need to go to the point of buying a shovel, but uh, do do some research on techniques for getting out of the snow because you really don't want to have to get, you don't want to get stuck somewhere and have to call uh, a tow truck company to get you out of there because as I mentioned, it's, it's going to be thousands of dollars and it could be a serious dent in your budget. An additional note when it comes to getting around Alaska, not so much pertaining to the vehicle, but more for the hiking, is rent a pair of snowshoes. They're easy and pretty cheap to rent from REI. I believe for my whole trip, I was able to rent them for about a hundred bucks and uh, they give you the hiking poles too. It makes getting around and walking on very snowy, which some of the snow can be up to several, two feet or even more, makes it a lot easier and a lot more convenient. And especially if you got a heavy, heavy backpack of camera gear, it's good to have your snowshoes in the car just in case you need them. Lodging is fairly cheap due to the uh, mentioned low season. The Airbnbs I stayed at were about 50 bucks a night. Those were like the cheapest ones that I could find. There were obviously more expensive options, hotels and more expensive Airbnbs. There weren't any hostels open in Anchorage due to sort of the COVID situation, but in Fairbanks, there actually was a hostel open, which was $35 a night. Uh, so it was pretty low budget. There were also Airbnbs in Fairbanks, but I, I chose to stay at the hostel. So there are budget options. I assume in the summer, the prices might be double or perhaps more. So do a little bit of research and book everything early, as I usually mention on my uh, guides. An important side note I should mention when it comes to your gear, we're dealing with very cold temperatures here in Anchorage. It's a little bit warmer. It was about freezing, maybe went down to about 18 degrees, you know, between 35 and 18 was the average around Anchorage, but then Fairbanks. And if you decide to go further up, it, it's going to be at zero degrees or less. You know, I've heard of it being negative 40. When I was there, the coldest it got was negative 10. So these are temperatures way below freezing and your camera gear will not act 
as it usually does at all. I made a separate video on how to deal with the battery life when it comes to time lapses. As I mentioned in that video, I suggested using a large battery bank and connecting it to your camera via a dummy battery. Depending on what camera you use, you know, some of the bigger full frame cameras, you won't have as many issues, but uh, your battery life will in general be greatly diminished. And then additionally, what you wanna take care with is when these batteries die, definitely have a whole bunch of batteries that are fully charged, keep them in a warm pocket, maybe with the uh, pocket warmers. But uh, once you do get back to uh, your Airbnb or your hotel, wherever you're staying, don't charge them right away. Wait for them to come up to room temperature before you charge them because there is a risk of overcharging and damaging your batteries. So uh, just a couple things to keep in mind when it comes to gear in these very cold Alaskan temperatures. Another technical recommendation as far as gear is uh, the type of shots you, you will be shooting. And uh, the ones that I ended up liking the most were these long focal length zoom uh, lens shots, close-ups of the mountain when it was really windy, the snow blowing, some of the golden light, the alpine glow hitting the mountains. I didn't really have too much to work with as far as foreground in a lot of the places. So these uh, close-up zoom detail shots of the mountains were some of my favorites. So uh, definitely bring your telephoto lens. Now let's get into the fun stuff, the locations. I'm gonna cover all the locations that I personally visited. My location guide that I put together was quite extensive, but uh, the problem is in the winter, a lot of these national parks or portions of the roads are not plowed, not accessible. Sometimes you need a snowmobile to get some places, which is an additional either rental or you have to take a tour to get to some of these glaciers. So there are some locations that are pretty much only accessible in the summer, but don't despair. There's plenty to see in the winter and it's a little bit more uh, adventurous because you have to explore these locations and they're not exactly just driving into a national park and hitting a trail and hitting the same uh, viewpoint that everybody has. You can kind of explore and be a little bit more creative. Check the national park websites and see uh, if there's anything about the road conditions because these things change uh, from season to season, day to day, and sometimes after a heavy uh, snowfall things are not accessible or for whatever reason do uh, a little bit of research on the specific locations that you'll be visiting and uh, the accessibility of it. Starting with the location I flew into, Anchorage, we have the beautiful Seward Highway. It sounds like Seward, but it's Seward with a D at the end. It's this 127 uh, mile highway along the coast, which during the winter is mostly uh, icebergs and, and chunks of ice kind of floating. Um, quite dangerously, I might add, I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit. But it's this length of highway, two lanes, plenty of pullouts, and uh, some areas are gonna be more photogenic for sunrise and for sunset because it's quite curvy. So you kind of have to use uh, photo pills or whatever uh, planning app you use to see the angle of the sun at sunrise or sunset because some of the pullouts stick out further and, and face more east or more west. But uh, there are plenty of opportunities to just pull over and uh, park your car, take, take some photos of the light the uh, nice alpine glow hitting the mountains, using some of the ice in the foreground. What I will mention is be careful. Um, some of the pullout areas, you can actually walk down to the water. And what's dangerous here is that the water looks like it's moving slow, but it's actually moving very strong, but very slowly. And there's chunks of ice and it's freezing. And also you, it's hard to tell because the ice accumulates on the land. It's hard to tell at what point does the land end and the ice begin. So there is the risk of you kind of walking out there and just falling either through a chunk of ice, not being able to walk back. The tide rises and, and, and lowers pretty quickly. So if you have some camera set up, don't set something up too close to the water like I did. I had to move some things back a few times when I shot there in one of the mornings. But uh, as most Alaskans will tell you, I actually got yelled at for standing too close to the water, though I was uh, being cautious. Um, just be aware of your surroundings. Um, there are some pullouts where you can't access the uh, the shore and you just kind of shoot like with the zoom lens, the distant mountains or whatever. You can actually fly your drone here because it's just on the outside of the Chugich National Forest. Got some epic drone shots, some time lapses and photos. My first sunrise wasn't as good as the second time that I visited, but plenty of opportunities for some interesting compositions using the ice or the distant mountains in your shots. While on the topic of scenic drives, I'm gonna talk about another one of my favorites, Glen Highway, which heads east from Anchorage all the way to about Wrangell St. Elias National Park. It's an incredibly scenic drive, plenty of opportunities to pull over, plenty of pullouts, amazing views. You can hit it for sunrise or sunset. You're gonna, just gonna have to plan according to the angle and see what the sun is gonna light at certain times of the day. 
but uh, very scenic drive even without taking photos but of course i had to stop and take photos as you probably will what i would recommend doing is probably scouting the area during the day dropping some pinpoints on google maps and then coming back later at sunrise or sunset to shoot these vistas but glen highway is very beautiful and plenty of opportunities for photos as well as drone uh, footage uh, fpv drones as i mentioned that i recently got into or just regular drones if you're into that and it's uh outside of the national parks, so drone flying is okay in most of these areas. I'm gonna cover a few locations in the closest national state park kind of area, which is the Chugich National Forest right next to Anchorage. The first location I'll cover is Eagle River Valley. It's about 35 minutes drive from Anchorage. Makes for a great sunrise spot if the conditions line up for you. This was the first location that I visited when I arrived at Anchorage the next morning. And unfortunately, it was a cloudy sunrise. I did get some interesting time lapses of the clouds kind of moving in over the valley, made some black and white moody images. There's a uh, couple of viewing platforms as you make the hike from the, the visitor center. A little bit hard to find if you go there early before sunrise and it's dark, but um, you'll see sort of some signs and make your way to the path. It's about a 20 minute hike down to uh, the first viewing platform and then there's a second one. I would recommend going to the second viewing platform. It is a little bit more unobstructed, it's larger and you can see all the way down the valley and you can use the river as your sort of leading line and pick off either a wide shot or pick off some close-ups close of the mountains and the textures in the mountains. But Eagle River Valley, a pretty uh, easy to access location and convenient if you're in or staying, staying by Anchorage. About an hour and 10 minutes from Anchorage going south down Seward Highway is Portage Lake and Glacier. It is a little bit outside Chugich National Forest, so you can actually fly drones around here and it's actually it's on the road that goes to Whittier, a small town and there's a iconic tunnel that people were telling me about, but I didn't actually make the drive because I didn't see any reason for it. But the lake itself in the winter is frozen over. I've seen some cool shots of the, uh, the kind of bubbles that you find at Abraham Lake in uh, Banff. So you can get some shots with the bubbles and the ice if it's clear and the glacier in the distance. There's uh, surrounding mountains, but when I was there, the ice was snowed over, kind of cloudy and chunky, so really didn't offer that shot for me but uh, I did pull up to the parking lot and make the one hour hike to the glacier where I got some epic FPV drone stuff. It's a um, really great sunrise location. The sun is gonna come across and light up the glacier from the side. It really depends what time of year, but that's how it was when I was there. And not a lot of people there in the morning. It does get quite busy just after sunrise and later on the day, and you'll see people making the hike and do not underestimate the length of the hike. Um, I would almost recommend snowshoes for this because sometimes in some areas the snow can be a little bit deep and when you're hiking with a lot of camera gear and you're kind of like stomping into the snow, into the ice, it can uh, be a little bit exhausting and take a little bit longer than if you had the snowshoes and you were sort of walking on the surface of the snow. The glacier itself is a little bit tricky to photograph. My favorite shot was actually a close-up of the textures. It kind of reminded me of a, a frosty dessert because you have the blue of the ice, a little bit of snow covering on top, and it looked like frosting. In hindsight, I might have taken some photos as I walked down closer to the glacier. There's some interesting textures and maybe using yourself or someone for perspective because it is a lot bigger than it looks like because as soon as you make the uh, hike to the, where you can see the glacier, you think it's a relatively short distance and a small looking glacier, but as you get there, you can see it sort of towers over you and is a lot bigger than it looks like. So uh, also keep in mind that it can be very windy. It was very windy when I uh, made the hike and my beanie actually fell out of my pocket. So as I was making the hike back, it was incredibly cold for my head. Luckily I had the parka and I actually found my beanie as I was making my way back. But uh, it can be cold and windy in the mornings as you would expect, but a uh, cool location to visit. Definitely get there early so you can avoid the crowds. And definitely the easiest to access glacier in the Anchorage area. Another Chugich National Forest location is Thunderbird Falls. It's a short hike, it's about 30 minutes from Anchorage. The hike itself is pretty short too, another half hour if you do the hike as uh, most people do it to a platform where you can view the falls from the top. I actually saw some cool shots of the falls taken from the ground to get to this area. You actually have to, from the parking lot, head down this very steep uh, sort of ravine and you make the hike alongside the river. 
taking caution not to step on any thin ice or anything like that. There's also opportunities for interesting uh, ice close-up shots as you make your way there. And do not do as I did and miss the fork in the road where you take a right to reach the falls, making it a lot shorter hike than what I did where I missed that turn and I kept going up. But there was a silver lining to that mistake because I came across a large frozen waterfall. I'm not really sure what the name is, but it made for a cool shot, little close-up shots. And people actually, as I was leaving, they were uh, climbing it, doing uh, ice climbing. And um, then I had a double back and then I made it to the actual Thunderbird Falls, which as another side note, I'll mention, this location is really not worth visiting if it is snowing or has been snowing recently, because as you can imagine, it's a frozen waterfall, kind of like the one in Banff that I visited. But uh, as soon as you have snow on that, you really don't have any of the texture of the water. And it really looks like a sort of snowed over ice kind of thing <laughs> in the corner. And uh, I really didn't use any of the photos. A little bit of the water in the bottom is, uh, is not frozen. So I did a long expo kind of thing, but uh, really a lot of effort for not a big payoff. So definitely, if you're gonna visit Thunderbird Falls, um, do it on a day where it hasn't been snowing. In the Chugich National Forest area, there are numerous hikes of which I didn't really do any because as I was trying to make them and I did my research, uh, even though it doesn't show up as inaccessible in the winter, I would drive by them. Some of them are right off of Seward Highway and the parking lot will be closed off and I assume it's due to something with the conditions, uh, avalanche risk or some something like that. And a lot of the hikes I didn't really have time for anyways. So if you go there later in the season or when there hasn't been a lot of snow, there are plenty of hiking opportunities. Moving further north, the drive to Fairbanks is a six hour drive on Parks Highway very easy to drive it's plowed regularly so uh, i wouldn't be worried about driving on it uh, denali national park itself is about four hours from anchorage so it's about halfway through the trip um, so it kind of makes sense more to uh, stay in fairbanks and drive down or of course stay somewhere near the park which uh, a lot of the lodges that i looked up weren't open because it's a seasonal thing so i did have to make the two hour drive from fairbanks to get to denali but uh, Denali is probably the most iconic national park in Alaska. It's probably the most well-known. There's a whole bunch of other ones, but everyone knows about Denali. And the area of Denali itself, just driving around, there's plenty of photographic opportunities. You don't even have to go into the park. You just, uh, you see some amazing vistas or just valley kind of shots, distant mountains. You can pull over in plenty of places. They found a frozen lake which was uh, sort of unmarked, so I'm not really sure where, what it was called, but I saw it pulled over, got some cool shots using the uh, cracks and textures in the ice um, as the sun was setting with the, uh, the distant mountains. Unfortunately, although there is the Denali National Park area, the whole area surrounding it is a uh, preserve, so there's no drone flying allowed, but um, there are some other locations, which I'll mention a little further down, which are uh, pretty much identical, the same mountain range. When I was in Denali National Park, there were about five trails that uh, I researched that were accessible in the winter because they only plow up to a certain point, so you can't actually make the whole drive into the park. But as you're driving there, you'll see the opportunities around, and uh, that's actually where I accidentally pulled over and got stuck in the snow because I saw an awesome shot and I pulled over and got stuck. And um, so don't do that. But a couple of the trails which I hit, one of which is the Healy Overlook Trail, must be done in snowshoes because the trail isn't really cleared off in the winter. And I uh, underestimated actually the effort that it would take even in snowshoes. And I really only made it about halfway or three quarters of the way up the trail and until the point basically where I saw a viewpoint. Most of the trail as you're making your way up there is in the forest. So you really should give yourself enough time if you're trying to make it there for sunset, which it was uh, recommended as a sunset location. So give yourself enough time to reach the location with an hour to spare, maybe a little bit more because as, the, uh, as is common with mountainous areas, the sun ducks behind the mountains and uh, you lo lose light rather quickly. But I hiked up, as I was saying, to the first viewpoint that I saw, got some decent shots, some wide, some close-up shots, a couple time lapses, nothing too amazing. I can't really confirm how much more amazing the actual viewpoint was because I didn't make it there, but Healy Overlook, Overlook Trail was a pretty cool one and, and the views from what I researched were pretty good. The stats for the trail are 2.7 miles each way and it's a thousand 700 uh, feet in elevation gain. So it is a pretty steep trail. The trail begins at the visitor center. It is off what is known as the Taiga Trail from which you'll see signs for a bunch of trails that you can visit, but this was just one of the ones that I decided to take and uh, you can park right there at the visitor center. 
reaching Fairbanks, there are some locations in the surrounding area that I researched, didn't really have time to visit. I did hit Murphy Dome on my first night when uh, we had a good forecast for the Aurora, but I either, either the forecast was wrong or I got there too late. Murphy Dome is about 40 minutes from Fairbanks, uh, it goes up a hill and it is far enough away from the city that you don't have any light pollution, although there is a uh, sort of telescope um, observatory up there and uh, there is light pollution around. And in general, the Aurora shots that I see uh, from Alaska and Fairbanks, a lot of them are just focusing on the sky and the textures of the Aurora itself, uh, as opposed to the Aurora shots that you get in Norway or Iceland, where there is some epic like waterfalls or beaches or the, in Norway you have the lodges and, and there's other foreground elements that you can incorporate into your shots. In Alaska, what you'll see mostly is just close-ups of the aurora, the sky, maybe some trees, maybe some selfie kind of stuff. Um, I will mention a location in a little bit where I got some cool aurora shots and incorporated some of the landscape and it was uh, a little bit further from Fairbanks so you didn't have to worry about the light pollution. But uh, in general, the aurora shots are not going to be the same ones that you get in Iceland. The areas around Fairbanks also make for great drone flying. There is no national park area around so you can fly pretty much anywhere and there are a bunch of uh, the lightly frosted look on the trees you know they're like as you're coming in from the south there's a lot of forested area where you can fly the drone over there get some cool shots maybe some close-up long focal length kind of things we'll be getting to our next location one of uh, one of my favorite locations on the trip which was Kastner Glacier. Kastner Glacier is about two and a half hours southeast of Fairbanks and this road will actually take you to Anchorage if you continue down and make a right at the appropriate junction. It is the longer way so I wouldn't recommend it as a method of getting to Anchorage or Fairbanks. But anyways, Kastner Glacier is an awesome location, very easy to access if you make the drive from Fairbanks and there is a small uh, parking lot. It actually shows up on Google Maps as far as where the uh, glacier is itself and you'll find the parking lot nearby. Um, it's a plowed out parking lot. You can park there and make the hike down. Uh, I would recommend snowshoes. I stupidly forgot to put my snowshoes on because it didn't look so bad at the beginning of the hike but as soon as you get down closer because you're basically hiking on top of the, uh, the frozen river I believe it's uh, heavily snowed over and the snow was like one to two feet deep and using the snowshoes would have definitely helped. It's about a 45 minutes, can be up to an hour hike depending on uh, the snow conditions. But once you get there, and I would recommend getting there early because it's quite popular as unassuming as it looks because there's no signs or anything, it seems like a lot of people know about it. So if you get there later in the day, later in the morning, there's gonna be people. But actually what's cool about it is it's a cave, like an ice cave, like the ones you see in Iceland. And um, and I'm, I was surprised how, how large and how awesome of uh, the shots that I got there which was pretty much only one iconic shot which I had in mind using the fisheye lens as I was walking in through the entrance and uh, using the fisheye lens to exaggerate the size of the cave but it is a pretty large cave and um, you can get some cool close-up texture shots um, if you're into that kind of minimalist kind of thing but uh, that wide entrance of the cave shot is probably the one that most people go for and another reason why you should get there early because you don't want to have to Photoshop people out or work around them or everybody's kind of like mingling around and getting in your shots, which can be annoying. So get there early. When I got there, we were pretty much the only ones and we didn't even go that early. It was just after sunrise because it was a two and a half hour drive, as I mentioned, from Fairbanks. But uh, awesome location, a little bit of a hike to get there, but definitely worth it. So the area surrounding Kastner Glacier, I really never found what the official name was. I asked a bunch of people. Nobody really could identify it or tell me what it was called, but it's sort of like the Delta Junction, Paxton area. But uh, it basically is the same mountain range that continues on from Denali, but it continues eastwards. So you have the very similar landscapes as Denali, but it's not a national park, which means you can fly your drone here. It can be quite windy. It was very windy on the two days that I visited but uh, I got some really cool FPV footage flying around there. And although it is windy, you will find as you drive around certain areas where the mountain blocks some of the wind and it seems like there's no wind at all, but as soon as you make a, a turn around another corner, it's crazy windy again. And uh, up there, it's so cold that the snow doesn't actually melt. So it's a sort of dry, more sand-like uh, blowing of snow, which uh, is pretty interesting, but it's, it's cold 
as I mentioned in general, so um, it was negative five, negative 10 when I was up there. But I shot sunrise there, I shot the auroras there, makes for great opportunities for both. It's about two and a half hours drive from Fairbanks, as I mentioned, but you're still within the area. The forecast was pretty decent and I hopped out of the car and shot some test shots and I saw the aurora forming and it was a little bit more to the west at one point, a little bit more to the east later on. And I actually drove down to the Casmer Glacier parking lot and using that valley as sort of my foreground, I could shoot the auroras and shot an awesome time lapse. And it was quite an amazing aurora and it pretty much made up for me missing it the night before. And I think uh, it might have been stronger that night. It's hard to tell because between the KP numbers and certain other elements that make the auroras what they are, it's, it's hard to tell how good of a forecast or how accurate of a forecast it is. But nevertheless, it was an amazing uh, display of the auroras and I got some great shots down there in the uh, Delta Junction Paxton area. Another six hours north of Fairbanks is a small, uh, more of a truck stop than a town called Coldfoot, which uh, can be driven to. There's also planes that go there. This is more of a warning than a recommendation, but uh, I booked a plane tour with a company, Alaska Winter Tours. I'll put the name here because I was extremely disappointed with the way it was marketed. It was marketed as a plane tour where you would fly around, see the Brooks Range, see the gates of the Arctic National Park, which is completely inaccessible by road. It's really only accessible by plane. So it's kind of marketed in the listing that you would be flying around and be plenty of opportunities for aerial photography. Basically, it's a $500 plane tour, but uh, as I found out only really when I showed up, at the uh, at the airport that uh, where the plane leaves from is that it's actually a ground tour of Coldfoot. The plane at ride portion of it is really just a small flight, a small plane flight to Coldfoot, from which you arrive and you drive around on this little bus, and uh, they take you on a tour of of a of a truck stop. I mean, you can imagine how exciting a truck stop is. Uh, there's some trailers. There's a dingy old uh, restaurant cafeteria. Um, they don't even include the food in the plane tour. It's an extra 15 bucks for the sandwich, a very mediocre sandwich and a bag of chips. It seems like even the driver struggled to uh, make it uh, exciting, pointing out things. And uh, I just ask a bunch of questions just to make some use of the uh, actual tour. But he basically drives you around, mentions a little bit about the history of this truck stop, which uh, it's a truck stop. Uh, how exciting can it be? And uh, really not, no opportunities to stop and get some photos. And uh, then you get herded back onto your little plane and make the flight back. It isn't exactly done at sunrise or sunset. It's a little bit closer to sunset, um, or at least the tour that I booked was a little closer to sunset, but it really wasn't any golden light because I guess it's not safe to be flying these small planes out in the, in the darkness. So I kind of made the most of it and shot some photos. Um, the windows weren't exactly clean, so I had to do a lot of Photoshopping. And uh, since we didn't actually get to Gates of the Arctic, we don't fly through the epic part of the mountain range. You see some in the distance, but uh, I must say I was extremely disappointed and it was very much a ripoff. Um, I, I don't know, the reviews don't seem that negative, but maybe it was made by people who just appreciate uh, the plane flight to the truck stop and they were excited about that. I was under the impression that it was a plane tour, a flight scene tour as they call it, where you would take photos and fly around and it was really was nothing of the sort. So uh, I would say do not take any plane tours unless maybe it is one of these small, very private companies that you can specifically, for probably more uh, expensive a price, you can specifically book to fly around. But anything that is a pre-packaged kind of tour thing, very uh, strongly uh, recommend against it and avoid at all costs. Another national park which is accessible in the winter is Wrangell St. Elias National Park. It's about three and a half hours drive from Anchorage. I kind of messed up where I didn't save enough time in the trip to make the drive. So on the last day, I kind of made a last ditch effort to try to make it there for sunset and uh, shot some drone stuff on the way there, which is pretty awesome. I was gonna pretty much show up and, and hope to find some great view or vista which I found a vista, but it wasn't really anything too uh, awesome. Nothing really going on with the clouds. I took a time lapse of the di very distant mountain. But Wrangell St. Elias does deserve its own few days to explore and see what kind of photographic opportunities you can find there. I just personally didn't have time for it. Additionally, there are countless uh, locations which I didn't have time to visit or were inaccessible in the winter. The Kenai Fjords National Park in the south by the coast, from what I've seen, looks really amazing in the photos. And it's only really accessible in the summer and there are just countless other locations 
that uh, I do not even touch upon in this guide, just covering my experiences in uh, Alaska in the winter. So I hope you enjoyed this photography guide to Alaska in the winter. It is definitely a location that I will be visiting, making a return trip to visit in the summer, but the purpose of this guide is for you not to discount it as a photographic opportunity to visit in the winter, these amazing landscapes. I just couldn't get enough of the magenta blue tones as the sun sets and hits the uh, distant mountains. Plenty of opportunities for photography, for drone flying as I mentioned. Be sure to like and subscribe for more tutorials and travel content.